Is Afghanistan devolving into another Vietnam? While the Taliban sits down with the United States, it continues to kill Afghan troops. I'm Imran Garda, and today's newsmaker is the Taliban Peace Talks. Vietnam was considered a forever war, a stalemate between an invading U.S. military and an entrenched enemy. Much like the Taliban, the Viet Cong were ousted from power, then entangled Washington in a quagmire, took back the country and slaughtered the allies of the United States. Fast forward another 45 years and history might be repeating itself. The Pentagon and the Taliban have drawn up a draft agreement for U.S. withdrawal out of Afghanistan. But away from the negotiating table, the battlefields continue to be bloody. On Monday, Taliban militants wiped out an entire Afghan army company. And that victory is not unusual. President Ashraf Ghani's security forces are dying in record numbers, with 45,000 being killed since he came to power a few years ago. So, will one day the history books compare the fall of Saigon to the fall of Kabul? Danae Savoya begins the conversation with this report. After more than two weeks of talks, a breakthrough of sorts. On Tuesday, the U.S. Special Representative for Afghanistan Reconciliation, Zalmay Khalazad, tweeted that conditions for peace have improved. It's clear all sides want to end the war. Khalazad and top Taliban official Mullah Abdel Ghani Barada arrived in Doha in February for a fifth round of peace talks. From the beginning, Washington has wanted to include the Afghan government in the negotiations, but the Taliban has refused to recognise Kabul. And Taliban attacks on Afghan forces have shown no sign of abating. On Monday, they claimed responsibility for an attack in which 16 soldiers were killed in the northwestern Bagas province. Earlier in the year, the US and Taliban representatives agreed that any peace deal would require agreement on four issues. Troop withdrawal, counter-terrorism assurances, intra-Afghan dialogue and a comprehensive ceasefire. On Tuesday, they reached a draft agreement on the first two. When that agreement uh, in draft is finalised, the Taliban and an inclusive Afghan negotiating team that includes the Afghan government and other Afghans will begin intra-Afghan negotiations of a political settlement and comprehensive ceasefire. But Kabul still seems wary. Unless the Afghan government has direct negotiations with the Taliban, the Afghan people have the right to be concerned. One sticking point in the negotiations has been agreeing on what's defined as terrorism. Washington's plan to withdraw troops depends in part on the Taliban agreeing to stop allowing Afghanistan to be used as a hub for terrorist attacks outside the country. But the Taliban says there's no universal definition of terrorism and doesn't want the word used in the agreement. The US has been at war with the Taliban since 2001. And despite its history of violence, the US State Department doesn't list the Taliban as a terrorist organisation. But Al-Qaeda, Daesh and Tariqi Taliban Pakistan are on the list. So is the Haqqani network, which many analysts say is part of the Afghan Taliban. It's enough to confuse even the US Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, who last week told a group of students, I have a team on the ground right now trying to negotiate with the Taliban terrorists in Afghanistan, trying to achieve an Afghanistan that's not at war. Is something changed here in which the secretaries believe that they are terrorists? And then what does it say about the US negotiating with terrorists in something that it's said before that it would never do? The, the secretary's words speak for themselves, and I'm not going to uh, go beyond um, that. So what makes a terrorist? And how much do labels matter when peace is at stake? Denise Savoya, The Newsmakers.
Let's bring in our panel now. Joining me from Washington, D.C. is David Sedney. He's, uh, he was a former U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense and is now a Senior Associate at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Javed Faisal is in Kabul. He's a former Deputy Spokesman to the Chief Executive of Afghanistan. And Graham Smith is in London. He's a former U.N. Political Affairs Officer in Afghanistan and now a consultant for the International Crisis Group. Gentlemen, thanks for joining us. Graham Smith, let me begin with you. Is the Taliban the one with the upper hand, are they negotiating from a position of power here? Well, it's not just me saying that, to be honest with you. Uh, the U.S. military produces analysis of how much ground is held by the insurgency and how much ground is held by the government. And year by year, they show more and more ground held by the insurgency. Now, you can argue about the finer points of that, but just about everyone agrees that the uh, battlefield momentum is with the Taliban right now. And that is reflected in what you're seeing in the negotiations uh, in Doha. Mm -hmm. The Taliban are behaving in a fairly confident way, as they should, because they are in a pretty good place uh, militarily. David Sedney, while they negotiate in Doha, they continue attacks, such as the one we saw in Western Afghanistan that killed 13 Afghan soldiers. What does that tell you? Well, it tells me that, the, as Graham said, the Taliban feel that they have an advantage, and they're pressing that advantage. Uh, it does not seem to be any indication that the Taliban will be stopping their military attacks in the near future. Uh, ceasefire has been on the table. There was a three-day ceasefire last year. It was very, very successful. In fact, it was very successful among Taliban soldiers. That scared the Taliban leadership. So now they are very reluctant to go to a ceasefire until they get something in the negotiations that will put them in a permanently strong position. Uh, it's a very difficult set of negotiations. Javed Faisal, let's go to the Afghan on the panel. Do you trust them? I think this is a good start. We welcome the peace talks, but uh, it could be both a success and a failure. Uh, if we are to trust them, uh, I think it's up to Taliban. The success of this peace talks belongs to the Taliban. They have to show willingness to talk to the Afghans. They have to show willingness to peace. If they continue to attack and kill us in big numbers, it doesn't mean that they have any willingness uh, for peace. There is no willingness if they continue to have attacks. But if they are willing to cut its ties to terrorists, if they are willing to agree to a ceasefire, if they are willing to agree to sit with the Afghan government and the people, then we can trust them. But still, there is a long way uh, to get to that point. For now, we don't see any willingness of Taliban for the peace process. And uh, as a P8, at this stage, uh, it's not seen as an mm -hmm. Afghan peace, but a peace between Taliban and Americans and Pakistanis, right. not the Afghans, because the Afghan people and the Afghan government are not presented in those talks. Right. Javed, would you go so far as to agree with your former boss? the chief executive, Abdullah Abdullah, who believes that the Taliban is actually just using these peace talks in Doha for propaganda purposes. I think if we go to the past of such discussions or intentions, however, this opportunity is a unique opportunity, but we have had talks with Taliban in the past too. In as Pakistan wasted time, Taliban have wasted time. Uh, they were not willing to join peace talks. And again, today, uh, their intents are not peaceful. Those are even more volatile, and uh, this we cannot trust them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Graham Smith, when you hear this from Javed Faisal, and the Afghans clearly feel left out, right? So we're seeing Zalmay Khalilzad meeting with the Taliban leadership, but it really should be Ashraf Ghani meeting with the Taliban leadership for a true sustainable peace, right? Well, for really sustainable peace, what we need is intra-Afghan dialogue, conversation between the people of Afghanistan about their shared future. And, you know, it's not just uh, the people in the government who feel left out at the moment. If you look at the last uh, parliamentary elections that happened in October, only about two-fifths of eligible voters participated. So you have millions of Afghans who feel shut out of the so-called democratic process in Afghanistan. And so there needs to be some way of creating a political framework that represents all of the people of Afghanistan. And that's going to be a very, very difficult process. It will probably take years. And, you know, we're hearing a lot of anxiety from Kabul right now uh, for very good reason about how this is going to go. Because uh, if there is a political misstep here, if the diplomacy does not go well, there is a risk of a renewed multifactional civil war. We could be plunged right back into the bloodbaths of the 1990s. So 
people have reason to be worried. But I have to say, this is also a chance to end the largest war in the world. More mm -hmm. people are being killed right now in Afghanistan than in Syria and Yemen combined. So this has to end, and diplomacy has to be given a chance. David Sedney, when those numbers came out from the president himself at Davos, when he said 45,000 members of his country's security forces were killed since he became leader since 2014, 45,000, that was from the president himself. What do you think the decision makers in the Pentagon and the White House and the State Department were thinking? Well, they would have already known that figure, so I don't think that particular announcement made any made it was any new information to them. But you have to realize that beyond the 45,000 figures cited by President Ghani, there are just as many and probably a lot more Taliban who have been killed, and also thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of Afghan civilians have been killed and wounded. So the actual casualty tolls are much higher than that. Uh, so yes, this is a horrible war, as Graham said, and it, and it has to be ended. But in the 1980s, there was also a horrible war in Afghanistan where hundreds of thousands of people were killed. And there was a peace agreement, and a Soviet general walked out, and the Soviet troops withdrew. That was followed by an even worse civil war with even more people killed. The, the, uh, it, the movement of al-Qaeda into Afghanistan, the attacks on 9-11, and a lot of other things have happened since. So, yes, peace is needed, but it must be a good peace, a just peace, a lasting peace. If all you do is just pull out U.S. troops and don't do anything else, then Afghanistan will, exactly as Graham said, descend into a civil war that will probably infect many other countries in the region and influence people around the world. But, David, is it really about the U.S. wanting a lasting peace? If it can be absolutely ascertained that the Taliban won't be giving up their country to some sort of foreign force or group of foreign fighters as they did with al-Qaeda, which used it as a launching pad for 9-11 attacks, if they don't do it to Daesh or, or anybody else, if the Taliban just stays local and the U.S. can come to an agreement with them and leave, it's about saving face for the United States, isn't it? It's about another Vietnam of trying to not admit defeat and just leave when, when you can. Well, I think you have to look exactly at what Ambassador Halazar, the U.S. negotiator, has said. He said there are four parts to the talks, discussion of U.S. troop withdrawal, a commitment by the Taliban to, to ensure that they don't support the terrorists, a intra-Afghan dialogue, which has to include the government, and Ambassador Halazar has said that has to include the government, and a ceasefire. So there are four elements, and Ambassador Halazar has said nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. Uh, so I don't think it's uh, the, the, bi the, the bilateral thing that you were laying out. It's actually a multilateral thing, unless all of those things happen, including, mm -hmm. most, and really most importantly, as our colleague from Afghanistan says, the Afghan people with the Afghan government have to sit down with the Taliban because no just and lasting peace can happen without all Afghans involved and without any excluded. Javid Faisal, do you believe that the United States is, to, is committed to fulfilling all four of those aspects as it talks to the Taliban and tries to come to some sort of solution? Uh, let me make it clear. We are not fighting a civil war in Afghanistan. This is not a civil war. We are fighting a war against international terrorism. It's alongside our international partners, be it the United States or the Europe or NATO. So when we are fighting a war against international terrorism and the goal that we had from the very beginning has not been achieved yet, it doesn't mean it's a success for the U.S. Uh, it's not a success for Taliban either or for Pakistan. It could only be a success when we achieve that goal, either through peaceful means or through battlegrounds, because as a P8, uh, we don't see that's happening. And even when we hear uh, the words about the agreements of Afghan soil not being used by terrorists and Taliban uh, agree to that with the Americans, I don't think it's making sense because uh, uh, you know, the Taliban are being supported and funded by our neighbors, and those neighbors are not likely to agree to such terms because they still see their interests in support of the terrorism. So uh, if the Americans uh, want a very peaceful end to this uh, situation in Afghanistan, I think uh, we have to achieve the goals. And it's better those goals be achieved through peace. But if peace does not work, if Taliban uh, do not have any peaceful intentions uh, uh, for peace in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. then I think uh, it's not a success. And uh, we cannot be very hopeful or optimistic about its future. It could only be a success when there is an intra afghan dialogue and, and when we achieve that goal, when we mm -hmm. can be assured that Taliban and Pakistan and others 
can no longer be in support of terrorism, Al-Qaeda, and other right. violent groups in this region. And Graham Smith, one of the crinkles in the talks was that, of course, there's a, a demand that the Taliban stops all support of terrorism or conducting any terrorism, and they go, well, what do you mean by terrorism, right? Because for them, the, the presence of any foreign occupying troops means that those foreign occupying troops are fair game. They don't consider that terrorism. Are we ever going to find a solution to that? Yeah, I think we will find a solution to that uh, because as it stands today, the Taliban every day in eastern Afghanistan are fighting bloody battles against international jihadists. They're the local affiliate of the Islamic State, Islamic State Khorasan. And the Taliban don't like those guys, and they're battling them extremely hard and dying out there uh, in the mountains of eastern Afghanistan. And so that's something that the Taliban have in common with the United States and have in common with the Afghan government. And so I think there is actually a basis for some kind of agreement on counterterrorism. But you're right. We have to agree on what we're talking about when we're talking about terrorism. It's not going to be enough for the United States to just say, we decide those guys are terrorists, therefore you should kill them. Uh, there will have to be some sort of language hammered out about uh, making sure that Afghan soil is not used as a launch launching pad for attacks against other countries. But keep in mind that since 2001, Afghanistan has not been a launching pad for any attacks against any country, as far as I know. And so uh, this is actually something where we can reach agreement with the Taliban. Are you that optimistic, David Sedney? Well, Graham has accurately stated what's happening with Daesh, but the big problem with the Taliban from 2001 on, of course, has been al-Qaeda. And the Taliban uh, have apparently been resistant about saying they would not continue to support al-Qaeda. And I have to be clear on one thing, as Javi said, this is not an issue where the Taliban will say that Afghan soil cannot be used against the United States, but the, the Taliban don't control most of Afghan soil. Uh, they control a larger and larger part, as Graham said, but a lot, a lot of it they don't control and never will. So uh, the most important part is, do the Taliban support al-Qaeda and other groups? And I, I understand that in this most recent round, there was discussion about that. They may have come up with language, but I would say that if this agreement does not specifically say the Taliban will no longer support al-Qaeda, and Ayman al-Zawahari, the the current leader of al-Qaeda is in areas where the Taliban have influence from everything we hear. Uh, without mm -hmm. that, uh, that agreement will end up not having uh, support in the United States, including by people in the White House. So I think we need to look very carefully at not just the definition of terrorism, but the naming of al-Qaeda is really important. Right. Good point about al-Qaeda. Javed Faisal, if you had the power to decide tomorrow morning as to whether those 14,000 U.S. troops stayed or left, what would you do? You know, we don't want uh, foreign troops to be in Afghanistan forever, but we do need them until we achieve that goal we have set at the very beginning 18 years ago. And that goal is still not achieved. I don't think it's acceptable to anyone here in Afghanistan or should be in the world that Taliban say we will not uh, be supporting Al-Qaeda because they were saying 18 years ago, we are fighting Americans because of Al-Qaeda. And today they are saying we are fighting Al-Qaeda because of Americans. I don't think it's very likely to happen. Uh, and at the same time, uh, if that's even to happen, uh, Taliban uh, are still not a force that could be trusted. So we would definitely uh, need international presence in Afghanistan until we achieve that goal that we had. And until we are assured that things are not going back to the very beginning. Uh, in the same time, I think uh, it's uh, if we go to, to the original discussion, it's not uh, in accordance to the, princing, uh, to the founding principles of the United States to talk to terrorists, and Taliban are terrorists. Uh, and when they were to sign uh, a BSA, bilateral security agreement with Afghan Taliban, with Afghan government. Uh, how can Americans today talk to Taliban about BSA or the withdrawal of foreign forces or not giving space to the insurgents or Al Qaeda in Afghanistan? We have a state in here, we have a nation is here. Mm -hmm. Taliban do not represent a state, Taliban do not represent a country or a nation or a government. They are a terrorist group. So, any kind of talks about the future of Afghanistan whether it's about its soil not being used against others or whether it's about the withdrawal of foreign forces from Afghanistan, it should be discussed with Afghans. In what capacity are Taliban 
giving this assurance to the Americans. And in what capacity are the Americans accepting this assurance from the Taliban? I think uh, these are very fragile discussions, and uh, there has to be more concrete steps taken to make sure that the two other elements of the peace talks, a ceasefire and an intra afghan dialogue, uh, it does yeah. happen. And uh, then the assurances are being given by the Afghan people in the government, not by a terrorist group who was never trustworthy and who could never be trustworthy in the future. Okay. Javed, Graham and David, it's been good talking to all of you. The reality that this war has gone on for so long that there are many U.S. soldiers preparing for their first deployments of Afghanistan who were not born during 9-11. And the battle continues, the war endures, peace is elusive for now. David Sedney, Graham Smith, Javed Faisal, thanks for joining us again on The Newsmakers. More than 500,000 people are living in Thailand who cannot legally call the country their home. They don't have identity cards and can't work, buy property, vote, get married or travel. They're stateless. And according to international law, it's a status that shouldn't even exist. Their plight was highlighted last year when a group of Thai boys were rescued after being trapped in a cave. They became national heroes, even though some of them weren't even recognized by the nation. TRT World's documentary series, Off the Grid, went to Thailand to understand their story. They live without really existing. More than half a million people are behind these mountains, where very few can see them. They have no citizenship, they, they have no hope. They're not able to dream like other people dream. And they can't get out. Some have become Thailand's national heroes. In a country that failed to acknowledge them. The miraculous Thai cave rescue has also brought to light their lack of status. Nobody should left behind because of lack of citizenship. Who are they? And how do they live? This is the story of the people many call the Invisibles. Well, I'm joined now by TRT World Director Producer Mohsin and Naimi, who directed the documentary Off the Grid, Ghost Citizens. And in London is Amal de Chikera, co-director of the Institute on Statelessness and Inclusion. Good to have you both on the program. Amal, I'll get to you in a couple of minutes' time, but we've just seen the trailer, Mohsin. It's fascinating that, you know, it's said that they're called the Invisibles. Who calls these people the Invisibles? Well, they call themselves the invisible. All the people I interviewed, they all said that they don't belong to the society, they don't belong to the Thai society, they don't, they like, uh, they legally uh, mm -hmm. don't exist, so they live without really living. The, the problem that they have is that they have many restrictions, uh, they can't work, they can't, uh, they can't uh, marry, they can't vote, they can't buy property, and they can't even travel outside of the province. Mm -hmm. They need a special permit for that, and they live in confined area, mostly in the north, next to the uh, Myanmar border, mm -hmm. and this is why they think they like having some uh, life without really like, you know, being seen. That's why they call themselves the invisible. Right. Let's take a listen to what uh, Vut, uh, one of the characters I interviewed for the documentary, has to say about his life. Okay. ตั้งใจครับแล้วก็อยากอนาคตก็อยากเป็นนักฟุตบอลครับก็เลยตั้งใจใจบอลดีครับอย่างที่ 2 ก็
ไม่ได้ลงบ้างก็เขาจํากัดอะไรแบบนี้ครับก็เลยอยากได้สัญชาติเพื่อมีโอกาสได้เล่นฟุตบอลได้แบบคนอื่น Yeah, what Cam c o e fascinating. The wild boars player, and of course, spotlight on them because of the entire cave rescue. Is that what inspired you to to do this story? Because off the grid has gone to Lebanon, to to Syria, to parts of the Middle East, to to France in the yellow vest. What make you made you want to do this story? Well, this story, like I think, like uh, everyone else who watched it, was really like you know gripped, mm -hmm. and and most of the people followed. The, the incredible journey of this, uh, of this young uh, footballer who gets stuck in a cave uh, for almost three weeks with no food, no material, nothing. So when we uh, found out that, okay, this is very interesting, there might be some, something to, to tell about their mm -hmm. story. Then we found out that the four of them, the coach and three players, were stateless. And in this region, it's not like, you know, unusual. But the, the interesting part is that the, uh, the um, This, this, this young uh, people, uh, when we went there to try to, uh, to interview them, we found out that they're not, of course, the only one. There's mm -hmm. more than half a million yeah. people living in the northern Thailand. And most of them have the same life as Wood or like other people who don't have any chances for the, for the same, region, uh, same man, reason I mentioned earlier. Right. They, right. they, they don't have like the same rights. They don't have the same, the same, the same duties. Yeah, and, and, and the, yeah, there's an NGO, right? Project mm -hmm. Justice. There's a, there's a profound point, and I haven't seen all of it. And I'm looking forward to watching it. I promised you I'll watch it. I'll mm -hmm. watch all of it. I've seen the trailer and I've seen some clips, right? But there was a profound point one of them made regarding the international attention on them and the semblance of justice that they got for some of them as a result of this. Let's have a little listen. People in this village, they, they've been living here for what, 80 years, 70 years. And many, uh, one, the first generation, many of them passed away without citizenship, you know. Now the next generation still don't have citizenship that live here. So I really believe they have right to, to live. They have right to have that freedom like other people do. And same right as all other people do. If I was stateless and the children the young people they've been uh, trapped in the cave, uh, got, got given the uh, citizenship. I will, I've been sad. I will be sad because why? You know, do I need to go to the cave and trap in there? Do you have to be a hero to get citizenship, Moxie? Well, in certain way, yes. Uh, the uh, the wild boar, for example, after they uh, they get rescued, their situ the situ the status were, was fixed quite quite fast actually mm -hmm. after a couple of weeks the the government gave them documents because they become ambassador of the country they were traveling all over the world uh, to show their resilience and to share their their experience with other young players I'm, I'm speaking about like Argentina or right. Manchester United so in that situation uh, the government has to also avoid some kind of embarrassment because they can't say these children are like you know heroes but in the same way we don't recognize them but uh, there is other people like heroes, which we featured also in the documentary, like one guy um, called Mong. When he was 12 years old, he became origami champion. And then he managed to get to Japan and he won. He won two, uh, two trophies. He came back. He was promised. For Thailand. For Thailand, yes. Right. He was promised citizenship, but he never get it right. until nine years. So during these nine years, Mong couldn't shape his future. He couldn't go you to see. university, for example. Mm -hmm. So he didn't get all the chance to become what he wants to become. So in that situation, Mong was a national hero because right. the entire press knows about him. However, he never gets citizenship until last September because obviously the wild boar case fast track also right. his case. So, and some people are waiting like, you know, until 80 years old because right. when you're not a hero, it's an endless, uh, endless situation. And we witnessed also some people who've been uh, waiting for citizenship until 80 or 90 right. years old. And of course, so to yeah. answer your question, yes, you're right. You, know, you don't have you to have be to a be hero. hero. You have to right. be a superhero. You have to be a superhero. Let me bring in Amal de Chakera here. Amal, we're discussing statelessness in general and we're going to broaden it out soon and look at different contexts. But is Northern Thailand very unique because it's at a crossroads of different ethnic groups and different nations touching each other? So. The fact that half a million people are stateless is almost the norm for the region because it's Northern Thailand. I mean, uh, yes and no. Uh, I think every country thinks that it is unique in some ways and that exceptionalism does lead to countries 
treating minorities in particular in a, in a discriminatory manner and excluding them. So what you find in Thailand, you also find in Myanmar with the Rohingya community, for example. You find in the Dominican Republic with ethnic Haitians. Uh, you find in, in Latvia with ethnic Russians. Uh, so there are many countries in which minority communities, communities with a migrant heritage, are deprived of their nationality and made stateless. Uh, and I just wanted to pick up on one point that was made earlier, uh, which is that often what we see is that you have a certain point in history when a group is made stateless uh, or a group fails to access nationality for a range of socio-political reasons. But the reason we still have statelessness in the world today in such large numbers, and my institute estimates numbers to be at around 15 million at least, mm -hmm. is that generation after generation, children are born into these communities and they're denied their right to a nationality. And this is an issue that if you look at the international legal framework, there is very clear international standards which set out that every child has a right to a nationality. Right. And that if a child would otherwise be stateless, the country in which the child is born should grant that child nationality. And the failure of states to uphold these obligations is the reason that we have so many millions of stateless people in the world today. Yeah, important point about the generational statelessness. Mohsen, this is where we thank you. We'll be watching the film, no doubt. And Amal, you stay where you are. Now, just a, a reminder, the documentary Off the Grid, Ghost Citizens, premieres this Saturday at 17.30 GMT here on TRT World. And of course, the YouTube clip will be available as well. Well, as we mentioned, statelessness is not a problem that exists just in Thailand. For various reasons, governments around the world decide to revoke citizenship. Under the spotlight most recently are foreigners in Syria. In the town of Baruz, thousands are fleeing what's left of Daesh's self-declared caliphate. Now where they can go is up for debate. Let's take a look. <laughs> Well, joining me now from Idlib is the founder of Live Updates from Syria, Tawkir Sharif, whose British citizenship was revoked by the UK government. In London is former Guantanamo Bay detainee Moazem Beg, who's now the director of outreach at CAGE, an advocacy group that controversially campaigned for Anwar al-Awlaki, who later became an al-Qaeda leader, and Mohammed al muazi before he became known as Jihadi John. And still with us in London is Amal de Chikera, co-director of the Institute on Statelessness and Inclusion. So now we're looking at another aspect of statelessness, where it gets revoked by governments who decide you don't deserve to be a citizen of this country, and we're going to take away your passport, and we don't want you anymore. Tokir, this happened to you. You're in Idlib right now. You were technically a British citizenship, but Sajid Javid says you're not one anymore. How do you feel about that? And what does that mean practically for your life? Yeah, um, well, hopefully I'm not fully invisible yet, uh, like some of the invisible persons mentioned before. But of course, this has had an adverse effect on my life and I mean I suppose it's highlighting the use of uh, this legislation that's taking place uh, in Britain uh, where racist laws are being used to basically paint everybody with the same brush. Um, for me when I received a letter saying that uh, my citizenship was to be revoked I was very shocked because uh, I'm an aid worker I'm not one of those people 
who's you know escaping from Baruz right now. Um, so I was astounded that you know I would be one of those people. Tokir, they say that you traveled to Syria because you were aligned with an Al-Qaeda-aligned group and that you're a threat. The Home Office says you're a threat. Are you a threat at all? No, of course not. I mean, I traveled here in 2012 before the presence of Al-Qaeda here. And um, I was an aid worker even before I came to Syria. I was uh, on the Mavi Marmara uh, Freedom Flotilla. I traveled to Gaza also in 2009. So my aid work and exploits are quite well documented. Um, in regards to being aligned to an AQ-aligned group, I mean, the wording is so broad. In the government's own admission, they're admitting that, and they're saying that I'm not uh, a part of IS. They're saying that I'm not even a part of uh, Al-Qaeda. They're saying that I'm not even a part of a group that is mm. aligned to Al-Qaeda, so namely uh, HTS or JN, etc. They're saying I'm aligned to them. So, I mean, this is, you know, uh, totally uh, preposterous. I mean, it's not even guilty by association. It's guilt by association with a degree of separation. So, Muazzam, if the government did have something or did have some sort of fair reason, should they have the courage to actually name it and say, this is the organization we think you belong to and this is why? Should they be clearer about what they're claiming here? Well, let's get this into context first. Let's understand that this process has been used arbitrarily um, uh, with the use of secret evidence, evidence that you can't challenge, evidence that your lawyers can't get to see. They are processed through the um, Special Immigrations and Appeals Commissions, and that in itself is a problem in a country that claims to be a bastion of freedom and democracy and human rights and uh, uh, adherence to the rule of law. Uh, if the government has evidence, and that evidence needs to be tested properly in a transparent court of law, um, there's no point in bringing 15-year-old narratives of saying somebody's connected to or aligned to, has, as, as Tokir has said, uh, through a degree of separation to an organization that actually, at the time when uh, Tokir was there, was being supported indirectly by the British government because the British government was supplying non-lethal aid to the Free Syrian Army, which was fighting alongside and sharing resources that had been provided by the British government uh, with organizations like Jabhat al-Nusra, right. which later transformed, of course, into H uh, HTS. So, so the, all of this needs to be tested, and you can't arbitrarily remove somebody's nationality and effectively make them stateless, which is against all of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and then say somehow you've protected the British public. Amal de Jakera, what kind of precedent does this set? I mean, I think it's important to, to ask two questions. I and mean, the first question is, uh, should a state ever have the power to strip citizenship of its citizens? And the second question is, should a state be entitled, if it does have that power, to, to go about doing so in a discriminatory and arbitrary manner? Uh, and I think in answering the first question, we should start with the second, actually. Uh, and if you look at the, the, the legal framework in the UK, it's actually quite interesting and, in, and incredibly, pro incredibly problematic because what it creates essentially are three categories of citizens. If you are a citizen by birth who has no other nationality, you cannot be stripped of your citizenship. If you are a citizen by birth who is also a national of another country, you can be stripped, by, stripped of your citizenship, the, the thinking being that therefore you will not be made stateless. But if you are a naturalized citizen, you can be stripped of your citizenship even if that would result in you being made stateless. And if you look, I mean, the fact that you have these three categories in it is mm -hmm. in itself discriminatory because it targets people from migrant backgrounds, from minority backgrounds. And if you look at the Shamima Begum case, which was also in the news recently, she actually falls in the first category in that she is a British citizen by birth who has no other nationality. But because of her Bangladeshi heritage, there was an assumption that she also had Bangladeshi mm -hmm. nationality and she was wrongfully stripped of her citizenship. So there's a, there's a whole range of issues around the fact that the, the law in itself is discriminatory and it allows for arbitrary decisions to be made. But then going back to the first question, uh, I mean, should a state ever be stripping it, its citizens of their citizenship? This raises a whole range of other questions, particularly in the context of international terrorism and the fight against terror. Right. Because what a state essentially is doing is saying, uh, A, that person X is problematic and we do not want that person back and B, therefore, that person is not our problem, that person is the problem of the international community. And in terms of cases like Shamima Begum uh, uh, and others, uh, you see the, the unfairness in terms of 
taking the citizenship of a person in terms of their own individual human rights. Right. But also you see the impact in terms of the international community. Okay. Where the British government has basically washed its hands off. Okay, its own so they've washed their hands. Okay, Tokyo, perhaps a parallel. There's a feeling amongst the right, and it's not just because I've been going through some of the the comments in, in sort of Daily Mail articles and so on. But with Shamima Begum, it's like, well, go back to Bangladesh. We don't want anything to do with you. And with you, maybe a similarity. Well, you're British Pakistani, so you can go to Pakistan. We, we don't want to deal with you, whether you're guilty or innocent. Tell me how you feel about that. You see, the strange thing is I feel as if I've been sold a lie. I mean, if you just listen to my accent, I've got an East London accent. I was born... Uh, and raised in London. So I'm a Londoner, whether they like it or not. Um, I studied in East London. I studied in university in the UK. So in a sense, I'm British uh, uh, to the core in terms of culture and the things that define me. Even for me, coming out to Syria to help the people was something or good values that I learned uh, in Britain. So when people say to me, go back to where you come or came from, um, I don't really have a place that I can go back to. I mean, Pakistan, yes, my parents uh, were born in Pakistan, but they also lived most of their life in the UK. I feel many of us feel betrayed because we were sold the lie that we were really British. We had the, the right, uh, mm. the equal right to vote, the equal right to an education, the equal right uh, to due process. Right. And that's something that I'm being denied right now. I'm saying that, okay, if you believe guilty, put me in front of a jury and I will defend myself, right. not in some secret courts. Dokira, I don't want to be presumptuous and I've read a few articles about you before this interview, but as far as I understand, your wife is with you. She's British as well. And she's white British, if, I, if I'm correct. Has her, her citizenship hasn't been revoked, has it? This is a really uh, interesting question. Yeah, she's mixed race. So uh, one of her grandparents is, is uh, English, oh, okay. um, white. Um, and we feel that may be a reason why she hasn't been revoked. Um, there's other people, for example, Jihadi Jack, who was clearly a fighter with uh, Islamic State or IS. And his citizenship hasn't been revoked. And he's a dual national. He's the only one who's actually, actually saying that I am a dual national. So it seems uh, blatant that there is some kind of far-right uh, racist uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, interpretation or execution of these legislations, which makes many people uneasy. I mean, many MPs in the UK right now, and there's a big conversation going on. People are saying, are we really British or are we sub-British? Is there a two-tier uh, hierarchy system here right. in the UK. So amid this culture war that's taking place against the backdrop of Brexit and talk of immigration and so on, Moazim Beg, what kind of legal avenues or legal recourse does someone like Tokir have? Well, of course, there have been two cases recently, two uh, people of Bangladeshi origin who had their nationalities revoked and uh, managed to get them back. But that was basically based upon a technicality uh, connected to the one that may uh, affect Shamiba Begum's case. And that is if you haven't applied for Bangladesh nation nationality by the time you're the age of 19, um, then you automatically lose that right. Um, I, ironically, uh, I think we need to go back to some of these cases. The, one of the worst, most notorious cases of, of nationality revocation was actually Osama bin Laden. His uh, Saudi nationality was revoked, and let's just say the, less is, the rest is history. Um, the revocation of nationality of people is actually, as I said before, a controversial of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that no state will arbitrarily remove the nationality of somebody and effectively make them stateless or in another uh, article it states that they can't be uh, placed into exile. In the case of somebody like uh, Tokir Sharif and others, they have effectively been placed under exile, that they can't go anywhere. There are no embassies uh, where he is of any country, including Pakistan. How do you move pra practically? In, so in de facto terms, you have been made stateless because you mm. can't even go anywhere uh, in terms of of, of the freedom of movement that you're supposed to have. Um, uh, in terms of numbers, just so that we understand this, in Britain, uh, Theresa May, as, and her tenure, tenure as, as Home Secretary, uh, removed the nationality of about 36 people in 2014. Mm -hmm. In 2017, the numbers are around 105. Uh, we, from, from what we know, almost the, the numbers of those who are Muslims are the far greater majority. 
And this again tells you, I mean, just look at this. There are many people in the UK who are part of the far right who are descendants of um, people that came from uh, Eastern Europe and so forth. Um, would we, we be right then in removing their nationality if they're convicted of terrorism crimes and then sent back to where their grandfathers came from uh, in Eastern Europe? Of course that's not happening because that would be seen to apply to the people who are predominantly white and, and Western. And this is only happening to those who are darker skinned, people from Africa primarily or from Asia. And again, you can see from the case of Jack Letts, as, as Tokyo has explained, that this isn't happening to white Westerners, even mm -hmm. if they're part of an organization uh, that has been uh, responsible for the massacre of, of hundreds of, uh, of thousands of people. Tokyo, what's your next move? Um, my next move is to continue helping uh, the Syrian people here. I'm always hopeful and I believe that there are good countries out there that you know may see that we are bringing value to the people and want to support us and maybe you know give me a, a golden citizenship you never know <laughs> uh amal de Chikera, let me give you the opportunity to kind of wrap us up as you've sort of uh, been with us throughout the journey from talking about the thai footballers to this right now wrap us up please yeah i mean i i would like to just make one final point in terms of wrap up which is that if we go back to the three categories of citizenship which effectively are in play now as a result of this legal framework, what we have is a situation of the government saying effectively that if you belong to that first category and you are a terrorist, we will deal with you without stripping you of your citizenship. Uh, because it must mean that a responsible government will still put its national security first, regardless of whether you are a dual citizen or not. And then the question is, why can't that same approach be adopted to those who are dual nationals and those who are uh, naturalized citizens? Uh, why cannot those same measures be applied instead of taking that extra inhuman step of depriving someone of their citizenship and, and in the case of Taufik, for example, uh, leaving them in exile? Okay. Amal de Jakera, Tawkir Sharif, and Muazzam Beg, it's been a pleasure having you all on the Newsmakers. Thanks for joining us. Albania's government is hoping to start talks to join the European Union this year, but the NATO member has been rocked by a series of demonstrations outside its parliament in February and ever-increasing concerns about corruption. Thousands of Albanians are complaining about the connection between politicians and organized crime. Yola Abdafid has this report from Tirana. New buildings go up and old ones are demolished. Construction is big business in Albania with high profit margins. Private enterprise is attractive, especially in a country where the average wage is roughly $400 a month. Top Channel is a commercial TV station that broadcasts Fix Fare, a program that claims to stand up for the rights of people who feel cheated. For 16 years, it's been investigating allegations of corruption against businessmen and politicians. Politics, it's what they do. They uh, tell each other that he is corrupted, I'm not corrupted. But in 16 years work here, I have seen corruption in both sides. So I can tell you that they are just using it for politics. And uh, there are improvements, there is a lot to do, but they are using it for politics. The owner of this shop in Tirana has battled and won 11 court cases to evict a tenant who's refused to pay rent for six years. She's owed $60,000, but the government-owned repossession agency charged with evicting her tenant has failed to carry out the court's orders. The tenant is still in place. It's pure corruption. It should have taken just one policeman to vacate the shop. The contract had expired. I pay taxes on that property. A single police officer could have said, you don't have a lease agreement, get out. A lawyer says it can only mean that the tenant is well connected. In this sector, it was very difficult. It is getting better, but it's bad. So, uh, and corruption, of course, it's a powerful actor in all this uh, scheme. Corruption has seeped into almost all levels of society during the three decades since the collapse of communism. Albania has a reputation beyond its borders for trafficking people and drugs. Smuggling has become the standard practice since the 1990s. But people here also complain 
about tendering for public contracts and the construction sector especially. They are suspicious of the close cooperation between some politicians and organized crime. The economic damage caused by corruption in the past five years, according to the country's main audit office, is $4.2 billion, the equivalent of the government's budget for an entire year. The European Court of Audit says that uh, practically corruption now is um, in every root of the, of the system and practically now tenders and concessions are given only to a small group of people without, ten without competition. Yorida Tabaku says corruption has been a long-standing problem and admits it was also an issue during previous governments, including when she was deputy minister. The current government is facing a series of demonstrations. Most of the anger is over alleged corruption. I'm not saying that there, are not, there is no abuse in the administration. I'm not saying that there is no corruption in the country. I mean, otherwise we would be some uh, nation in Northern Europe, you know? Yeah, we're in Albania, we're in the Western Balkans. We know that we have uh, inherited problems with corruption. We know that we have inherited problems with the democratization system or the way our institution work. Albania's progression towards joining the EU will depend on implementing these reforms and guaranteeing the integrity of its justice system. Yolo Abdavid, The Newsmakers, Tirana. That's all for this edition of The Newsmakers with me, Imran Garda. Check out more of our stories on YouTube, Facebook and Twitter. Remember to like, follow and subscribe. Until next time, thank you for watching. Bye-bye.